Holy Spirit of the living God, powerful, mighty, and magnificent, I thank you so much for this day, and I thank you for this wonderful body of believers. I pray a blessing on this church and this community. I pray, Lord, that you would pour your spirit out in a mighty way, not for our good, but for your good and your glory. May your words be spoken with love and zeal. Amen. So I was recently talking to a preacher friend of mine, and we were discussing this, this corona business, and that we can't meet together. And my preacher friend was expressing his exasperation that he's preaching to an empty room. There's a camera, and there are the sound people, and there's a few people around. But by and large, this man who is used to preaching to a room of 150 now preaches to the lone tech crew. And he was really lamenting that the energy's not there, that the power feels flat. So we were talking, and, and it occurred to me that we're called the assembly. And that's where a lot of Christian life comes from. And so what do we do when we can't assemble? What does it mean when the assembly can no longer meet together? And as someone who's been YouTubing many a sermon and many a lesson and many a youth group, I can testify and say that there is something missing, that there is something not quite right. And I'm thankful for what we have. I'm very thankful for the equipment. I'm thankful for the way that the internet has made this possible, that we are, we are able to keep so close in this time, and it's wonderful, but the energy and the flow of the week is disrupted when we don't go to church on Sunday morning. And it really left me with a question. And that question is, what does the assembly do when it can't Assemble. We are the assembly unassembled <laughs> at the moment, or so it would seem. Or so it would seem, because we're living life without Sunday. And as a people, by and large, we're designed for community. We're designed for it. God built us to be in relationships, to be in community, and to be connected. And we have been outside of our desire for weekly worship. And for some of us, it's been heart, render, heart just heart-rending. For people like my wife, this is more church than she has ever missed in her life. Because ever since she was a little girl, they went to church. And in these last few weeks, she has missed more church than she ever has missed in her life. And then for those of us, it's been kind of nice. And we feel guilty to admit it, but we have Second Saturday. And my mind drifts to those who are relieved that they don't have to go to church on Sunday. And my heart hurts a little bit, but no matter how you're viewing this time, one thing is certain, that we as Christians are living in a disrupted flow. We are outside of the norms of the cycles of our life, and we're missing a vital component that's corporate worship. And can we even call ourselves the church if we don't assemble? I mean, can we really call ourselves the assembly if we're not? I mean, the word for the church in the Greek is called ekklesia, and by definition, it has four, and just as and this is a cold dictionary. This is this is cold dictionary, and and it says a regularly summoned legislative body, and that one's actually my favorite because if you substitute certain verses with regularly summoned legislative body, it, it's really quite nice. I think. And upon this rock, I will build my regularly formed legislative body. Like, yeah, Jesus, where do I sign? And uh, but then the other one is 
a casual gathering. People with shared belief. The global community of Christians. And we start saying, okay, this is starting to sound more like us. This is starting to sound more like what we've got. But by definition alone, what are we when we're unassembled? When we can't be a casual gathering? When our legislative body is disrupted? Well, fear not, dear Christian. Because even though these readings sound a little cold, even though it sounds like, can we relegate the church as a casual gathering? Can we say that the church is a regular legislative body or a a group of people with shared belief? This sounds so cold, but fear not. Because Ecclesia is just one word smattered throughout the New Testament. There's others. Jesus talked most about the kingdom of God. That's what he spoke of. Jesus didn't say regularly, church, 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 church. Jesus Christ said, the kingdom of God is at hand. And the thief on the cross, he said, surely I tell you, you will be with me in my Father's kingdom. And to the apostles, he said, many of you will not perish before you see my Father's kingdom coming in glory. So, the kingdom of God here on earth And there's nowhere in Scripture that tells us how often we're supposed to meet to be the kingdom of God. But then there's another word, and this is the one that's found mostly in the Pauline Scriptures, and it's the soma, the body, the body of Christ. And we're starting to warm up to this wording a little bit. The word church is starting to gain some love, and it's getting a little bit richer and fuller, that we're not just a legislative body. We are the kingdom of God on earth. Ambassadors for the kingdom of Christ. And on earth, the very body of Christ himself, the bride. And it caught my attention because we as Christians, we are an assembly, and we are citizens of the kingdom of God both here on earth and yet to come. We are a body. And what's interesting to me is when I think, if we're the body, okay, I still haven't answered the question, how do, when we can't assemble, then how, how do we be this body? But I'd also like to point out for us that this is a really new problem for Americans. The idea that we're, we, we're barred from corporate worship on Sunday, but for the persecuted church at large, This is business as usual. To the persecuted church, they say, oh, first time. (laughs) like, Because there are other places in the world. I I highly recommend a publication called Voice of the Martyrs. I I highly recommend it. It's a quarterly magazine that comes out, and a subscription is not very much, and it's a wonderful ministry to support, and it's great to give some perspective. But... For the persecuted church, they've been barred from assembly for some time, and yet they thrive, and they grow, and they worship, and they baptize, and they disciple. And yet, they're not allowed to meet. So, exploring this idea of how it's done, what does it mean? I'm going to start with a scripture, and what I'm getting into is 1 Corinthians chapter 12. I sincerely hope that you have your Bibles. If you don't, don't worry. They're in the pews right in front of you. And I was looking the other day, and I discovered they're even NIV. And so that's fantastic. That's what I preach from. So, you know, you don't want to be the only, the only NASB guy showing up to an NIV party, you know. But <laughs> I'm going to be reading chapter 12. And it's going to be an easy verse to find because it's chapter 12, verse 12. Just as a body, though, one has many parts, but all of its many parts form one body, so it is with Christ. For we are all baptized by one Spirit so as to form one body, whether Jew, Gentile, slave, or free, and we were all given one Spirit to drink. Even so, the body is not made up of one part, 
but of many. Now, if the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, it would not, for that reason, stop being part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, it would not, for that reason, stop being part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? And if the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? But in fact, God has placed the parts of the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. And if they were all one part, where would the body be? As it were, there are many parts, but one body. And the eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. And the head cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. On the contrary, those parts of the body that seem to be the weaker are indispensable. And the parts that we think are less honorable, we treat with special honor. And the parts that are unpresentable are treated with special modesty. And while our presentable parts need no special treatment, but God has put the body together, giving greater honor to the parts that lacked it. So there should be no division in the body, but its parts should have equal concern for one another. If one part suffers, every part suffers with it. And if one part is honored, then every part rejoices with it. Now you are the body of Christ, and each one of you is a part of it. And God has placed in the church First apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then miracles, then gifts of healing, of helping, of guidance, of different kinds of tongues. Are all apostles? The answer is no. <laughs> then that the answer is no, it's not in the text. I'm adding that in there. Uh, are all teachers? Do all work miracles? Do all have gifts of healing? Do all speak in tongues? Do all interpret? And then he goes on to say, now desire more desirable gifts, which is, and oh, I wish to preach the whole chapter because then he says love is indispensable. And no matter what gift you have, if you don't have love with it, then it's meaningless. So the reason why I wanted you to hear this is that we, as the bride of Christ, we're a living organism. We are a living, breathing organism. We are one, united in the spirit of God. One body, one church, the bride of Christ, united in one baptism, in one spirit. And the reason why I start here is so that when you know who you are, when you know what you're a part of, then what you need to do starts to become clear. And it may seem like an odd passage for me to start with, but I assure you, this is also going to be leading into something else to come later. I'm up to something. And I hope that every one of us Christians through this passage, I want you to really drill in and understand that every one of us has something to offer. Every one of us has something to share. Every one of us has something that we can bring to the group and say, this is what I have. This is my gift. And I offer it to the body of Christ. Every one of us. It doesn't matter how old you are. It doesn't matter whether you're a boy or a girl. It doesn't matter if you've been a Christian your whole life. And it doesn't matter if you turn into a Christian just today. You have a gift. And you're part of the whole. And the whole needs you. Because we are many gifts all working together to serve the Lord. That's the body's function. That's its purpose. That's what we do. Day in, day out, we serve the Lord. We serve God. One body, many parts, working in unity to bring glory to God as ambassadors of his kingdom. I have a gift, and you have a gift, and your gift is going to look a little bit different than mine. And you know, even if, even if I do meet someone whose gifting is the same as mine, and I'm talking about like preaching, even if I meet another preacher, God is going to put them into a different context. He's going to give them a different place to go. And he's going to have them minister to a different body in a different group. So there is gifting wheelhouses. And okay, I'm gifted with preaching, but I'm not the only preacher. And I say that to slide in. There's a little bit of humility attached with this gifting business. But you have a gift. And God takes whatever gift you have 
And he uses it for the good and the glory of his kingdom if you let him. If you make yourself willing, God will take whatever gift you have and he will move you where he wants you and he will position you just as you need to be to serve God and the people around you. And all Christians are unique as all humans are truly unique. God created you as the only you that has ever been or ever will be. I mean, really. And you're gifted, my family. You're gifted in amazing and spectacular ways. You're gifted in ways that I can't begin to explain in a 30-minute sermon, but I promise you, you're gifted. You, O oh Christian, you're gifted and uniquely to serve the whole, to bring your gifts Because your gifting is unique and completely necessary to the good of the body. You'll notice in that passage that why I started here is instead of action to know that you can say, I am a necessary component to the body of Christ. I have a gift and the body needs me. We have to know this first before we can start getting into action. Because Orthopraxy, that's right living, flows from orthodoxy, which is right thinking. So to know, first and foremost, you are unique, you are gifted, and you are a vital and necessary member of the body of Christ. You must know these things because they're true. When I tell you this, I don't tell you because I heard a TED talk on it. I don't tell you this because it's popular psychology. I tell you this because it's the Word of God. God says, I made you beautiful, gifted, and unique. So much to contribute to the service of the Lord. And if you don't believe that's true, if you say, I got nothing, minister. I'm just a broke down, beat up, X, Y, Z. My heart breaks because I've met many who believe this and somewhere along the way I can tell you that you believed something that wasn't true. Somewhere along the line, you started to believe something that wasn't the Word of God because the Word of God says you are beautiful, you are talented, you are gifted, and you are necessary. And I say you in the plural and all Christians across the world. This is true. And hopefully, by now you've you've started to wonder, okay, preacher man, I am unique, I'm gifted, I'm a beautiful snowflake. (laughs) All right, you have yet to answer the question that you started with, which is how do I become the assembly when we can't assemble? I was promised action steps. When this whole thing started. All right, well, buckle up. (laughs) Because I'm about to kick it into third gear. And I'm glad that you're wondering about these things. How can we be the assembly when we can't assemble? I'm special. Great. So, how do we go being the church without meeting on Sunday? Romans 12 gives us a little insight into that. And while we look for Romans 12, one thing that I wanted to mention also about the Corinthians passage that is prevalent to this is that it says when one part of the body suffers, we all suffer with it. And when one part of the body rejoices, we all rejoice with it. And so if you're watching this at home and you're hurting, I pray that you would let us know. I pray that you would reach out to us. With modern technology, we're a phone call away. And even if we can't come physically be with you, we can pray over you. We can pray with you. If you're suffering, we will suffer with you because we are one. So, on to this idea of Romans chapter 12. How do we worship when we can't assemble on Sunday? Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. 
Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, and then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, His good, pleasing, and perfect will. For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the faith that God has distributed to each of you. For just as each of us has one body with many members, these members do not all have the same function. Ah, We were just talking about that. So, in Christ, we, though many, form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. We have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. But if your gift is prophesying, and now this is getting into this action stuff I've been talking about. If your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. If it is serving, then serve. If it is teaching, then teach. If it is to encourage, then give encouragement. If it is giving, then give generously. And if it is to lead, do it diligently. It is to show mercy, then do it cheerfully. And then he goes on to say, love what is good and hate what is evil. But the idea that what action do we take? Well, I don't know. What are you good at? Where's your gifting? What has God blessed you with? Because just as we are all uniquely gifted, our service is going to look a little bit different. And that's one of the reasons why, by and large, the church, you can't walk in and then they just have a uniform for you to put on and say, okay, Christians, this is, this is what you do. This is, you're going to go out and you're going to preach this tract. Are all preachers? No. Are all administrators? No. That's one that I can honestly raise my hand and say, like, my own like, concept of a living nightmare is being stuck in a room full of folders and being told, okay, now you need to organize these. But if you told my wife that, she would just, <laughs> like, I have gone to heaven. <laughs> So this is how gifting works, is we all have a gift, and we all use that gift. But I can't can't stand up here and say every Christian has this gift, or every Christian has that gift. Because by and large, this list I gave you, and this is one of the things that I've run into with gifting um, like tests, you know, or be like, what's my gift? You know, answer these five questions and we'll tell you. One of the things that's hard about it is they just use lists found in the Bible. And I feel like these gifts in the Bible are valid and they're real. But what other gifts are there? I've met people who are gifted with technology. And these are the beautiful and wonderful men and women who hook up microphones and soundboards and and make our stage lights go and (laughs) and make sure the baptistry stays warm. But it doesn't say in there, and then there will be gifted Mac users. (laughs) No, like, but there are people who are gifted that I've met gifted mechanics. And if you don't think that a good mechanic is a gift sent from God, then you've never been ripped off by a bad mechanic. So having someone say, oh, you know, oh, preacher, I mean, you've got this gift of preaching. You get to get behind the podium and you tell people things and it's beautiful. I'm just a mechanic. But you don't know the impact you can make for the kingdom of God being a mechanic. Whatever you are gifted with, use that gift for the good of the kingdom of God. And if we're all gifted, we need to be giving our gifts away, offering our bodies as a living sacrifice, because we may not be able to meet together on Sunday. But if our worship is just an hour on Sunday then we are missing all the other hours in the week to worship God through service. If our worship is an hour on Sunday, then we're missing Monday through Saturday for opportunities to serve the Lord and to serve one another. If we suffer, we suffer together. Because this is our worship. Day after day is to humbly offer our lives and our will over to the care of God to do as he would with, to offer the gifts we have been given to the whole all week long. Because every day there's an opportunity to serve. 
Every day there's an opportunity. And if you're stuck at home and if you're quarantined and you don't want to go out, the, the World Wide Web. I recently went to uh, a meeting in South Africa where I said, I, I wonder what their Christian community looks like. And I got to go to a Zoom meeting where Christians were meeting in South Africa. And that was really cool. That was a lot of fun. But I'm getting sidetracked. But what, Because the point that I'm making is, even if now when you feel alone more than ever through the gift of technology, we can still be connected. And your gifts and your talents can still be used. Because if your gift, if all you think that you have to offer is a kind word to someone who's hurting, don't think for a moment that that gift isn't completely necessary at this time. And even just a kind word of encouragement could change someone's whole week. Whatever your gifting is, be sure you're using it every day, except for maybe Sunday, because that's a day of rest. <laughs> that's a whole nother sermon. But serve with gladness and sincerity, knowing that your living sacrifices worship to God. Your service is to and for God. And love is action. And if only I had time to continue to preach, because in both Corinthians 12 and in Romans 12, Paul gets into something that's real deep in my heart, and it's love. Because in Corinthians 12, you hear it at just about every wedding you go to. Love is kind, love is patient, love is sincere. And then in Romans 12, if you keep following where I left off, it's love in action. And so we do these things with love in our hearts. But that's a whole nother sermon. Because the whole point to this is saying, how do we act as the assembly when we can't Assemble, and the answer is serve one another humbly in love according to your gifting, day in, day out. And that's what it means to be the body, to suffer together and rejoice together. And on this earth, we Christians, we're ambassadors for the kingdom of God. We're salt and we are light. We offer a safe harbor in the storms of life to those whose lives are in shambles, and we are the keepers of the peace of God. We give freely to all who ask. God is a miracle worker. God can take any calamity and he can clean it up and turn it into a rich blessing. There is no problem that God can't just fix but turn into a blessing in your life and in the lives of those around you. And honestly, if there was one blessing I could think that would come from this COVID business, if there was one blessing I could think that, that the United States Church could gain from this is a deeper understanding that our worship is more than an hour on Sunday. If we could get that through this time when we can't meet and we say, I have two Saturdays now, but now something's missing. Our worship is more than an hour on Sunday, and if we could really learn that, if this disruption that we face could spurn us to be transformed by the renewing of our minds to a deeper understanding of our daily function as ambassadors for the kingdom of God, then we would learn the lessons that the persecuted church had to learn through hard knocks. And they had to learn through brutal adversity that worship is daily service. And we live out the church life the same way when we can and cannot be together. We live as ambassadors for the kingdom of God. See, we are in the world, but we are not of the world. We are set free from the, from the world as a holy and washed people set apart for the kingdom of God to work out His noble plans and His noble purposes to be washed through the blood of Christ, to be perfect and blameless. And we stand as those who have passed from the gates of death into the hall of life, living out our mission to stand as a beacon of light into a dark world, to be those who have a word of hope in a world that is hopeless, to be those who offer assuredness in a time of uncertainty. We stand as those with the very words of life 
to those who are perishing. And the thing is, we were that before COVID, and we will be that after COVID because we are the body of Christ, and Christ is resurrected. Death can't swallow him up, and death can't swallow up the body of Christ. So my prayer for you through this sermon is that you would start asking yourself, what's my gifting? And if you don't know, then reach out to us because there's someone whose gifting is helping other people figure out what their gifting is. <laughs> so if you don't know, don't worry about it. Reach out. There's someone that will be thrilled to answer that question for you. But find your gifting. Find your talents. Find your strengths and use them to the good of the kingdom of God. Some people, they're gifted in outreach. Some people are gifted in reaching out to the church that's already established. Wherever you called serve, serve with joy and gladness. Let us serve as a source of strength to one another in this trying time, always knowing that day by day, we offer our life and our will over to the care of God. May the Lord God on high bless you in abundance as you discover your gifts and talents and serve in whatever capacity that God Christ has called you towards. Peace and life to you in abundance, my family. May the Lord God bless you and keep you. May his face shine on you. May the Lord lift you up and give you peace. Amen.